Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Lorne Sulkas, all the way from South Africa. How are you doing, Lorne? Very well, thanks, John. How are you? Excellent, excellent. And Lauren has been speaking to audiences around the world since 1996, everybody from Sony to NASA to the World Bank. He's been on CNN. He's spoken on the world's largest stages because he's known as the big cat guy because Lauren had this great uh, career in management consulting. But then he decided to move to the African Bushveld and become a, a track, uh, become a um, a tracker uh, observing and a game ranger observing and tracking and photographing Africa's three big cats. Um, you're an internationally awarded wildlife photographer and, and an expert. And now you share all of this information with audiences, all the what you've learned from the super predators and how that can help people. So this is going to be fascinating today, Lorne, because I feel like uh, you know, that uh, we're in this kind of strange scenario today where it's almost like the predators out on, on, on and the bush felt is like it's everything is so unpredictable. And so I think it's a great subject. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. And thanks for having me, John. Yeah. Um, so let, let's just start off, uh, start off here. Um, so you're a management consultant. Everything's going well. You're in corporate. You're, you're in the corporate space. And then you decide that the, the, your passion is really, you wanna become a bush ranger. And so there's probably a lot of people out there who have, are passionate about things, but they're doing other jobs uh, and maybe they don't have the confidence to do what you do. So can you walk us through uh, the process that you went through to make this huge, which is a big switch and, uh, you know, and, um, and what convinced you to go ahead and make that jump? Great question. Thanks, John. Yeah, yes, you know, um, actually a little known fact, I'm, I'm not sure if you were aware of it, but I actually have, my first degree was actually a bachelor's in architecture. And oh, wow. so I've, I've, I've moved um, a couple of times. Mm. I've, I've made sort of big leaps and in particular, the switch from architecture to management consulting, it's a, it's a much longer story, which, which perhaps I can abbreviate, but that was a very big switch because that was doing that was really going against the grain and and in a sense taking the road less traveled for the first time that I did that where um, you know the, in in South Africa the way the way people are schooled typically is a, a lot of people go into universities for professions and so one doesn't have as there are in the United States broad based liberal arts degrees that one does first and then one chooses the specialty in South Africa, you pretty much go into that profession if that's your choice. And that becomes a quite a difficult thing to navigate at age 18 to know what you want to be doing for the rest of your life. Um, I thought I did know, and so I chose architecture based on having had, um, having showed a little bit of talent and drawing, and I did art for my high school. I, you know, my, I graduated, one of my subjects was art, and I loved it, and I loved drawing, and I loved building things, and and so it seemed like architecture was the logical progression. And then when I, I, I finished the degree, worked for a short while in architecture, it was at a time where the South African economy was really struggling. Anyway, so, so when, when, I, um, when I left architecture, everyone thought I was absolutely nuts. They thought I was crazy because here I was leaving this so-called stable profession. Right. And what had actually happened was I had started attending a workshop, a weekly workshop given by a, a man who was running a management consultancy firm, quite a big firm in, in Cape Town, South Africa. And I just loved his content. And he was doing a lot around goal setting. And because I had been a high level athlete at school, I was very familiar with not just the concepts that he was working with, but with actually some of the, the sports stars who, whom he was actually working with to kind of create video content around goal setting. And, and I just loved the work and I loved the content and, and felt personally enriched by what I'd learned through, through, through him. And one day I just approached him and I said, Manny, I'd love to work together. Let's talk about, let's put our heads together and see what we can do. And, we, and he said, fine, I've got all this content. What, what would you like to do? And I said, well, 
you know, I've had, I've had experience at, at high level competition and high performance. Let's, let's put together a, some, some content around, um, around helping the, the premier teams of some of the boys schools here in, in sports like rugby and cricket uh, develop, develop some, um, so, you know, develop some motivation for them around that. And so that's what we did. And I, I uh, he, Manny gave me free reign to kind of run with his content. And of course it was all his. Uh, we just kind of adapted it to the to that setting, and it was absolutely wonderful, and it was very successful, and I, I loved it. And that was my segue from from architecture into effectively the consulting world. And so, um, so, so, so let me just ask you: so you were you you got into the management consulting world? It was really exciting. It was interesting. You were almost building out this whole area for the first time for yourself. Uh, what what changed or what made you then decide that you wanted to make that big switch to being a bush ranger because it sounds like you you almost had created your dream job at that point absolutely and that's that's true and i had what what actually happened it was it was a an, a slow and organic process i grew up in cape town john and cape town is a big city and and cape town is far from the bush felt areas in in south africa and certainly in the rest of southern africa and so the closest that I always, that I got to the bush was, you know, the Beacon Island Resort in the, you know, on a beach. You know, that that was our idea of camping, my family. So I I had absolutely no exposure to the bush. But what what did happen was, because I became very convinced that the the world of leadership training and management consulting was something that I really wanted to pursue, I decided as as um, most perennial students do to go back and do a master's level degree again and so when I did that um, I was working part-time working for this management consultancy I also did some um, quite a lot of work for a, an organization called the life skills education project which was doing outreach life skills training for for youth in impoverished communities it was wonderful work very rewarding and um, together with that I, I did a, a kind of part-time master's level degree and that was in the behavioral sciences and while I was at university, I met a, a guy who still to this day is one of my best friends. He lives in, actually, he moved to, um, to Berkeley, California. Okay. And, and he had grown up in Johannesburg, which is very close to the Kruger National Park, close to Botswana. And he'd grown up in a family where they went at least four or five times a year to the bush. And they would camp wild, completely wild. So they got in their, their big, um, it was a Nissan Patrol, which is this massive like tank, very thirsty petrol guzzling vehicle. And they would hop in, uh, a family of four kids and, and the two parents, they would all get in this vehicle and they would just go and camp wild at a time where you could still do that. You can't do that anymore because there are strict restrictions. But Ralph, my friend, was absolutely in love with the bush and his passion transferred to me very quickly because he invited me to Botswana. I'd never been to the bush before. I was probably in my probably in my early 20s at that point. And so I was a very late developer when it came to to learning about the bush. I knew nothing about it. You know, for, to me, I, I didn't know the difference between a yellow bull hornbill and the, the, a, a pigeon that that I would find on my, you know, on my garden step. So <laughs> Um, but I went with Ralph and I absolutely fell in love with it immediately and instantly. And it was, it wasn't just, uh, I didn't lust after the bush. It was a deep love for the bush. Um, and it's a very difficult thing to describe, but it's, um, when, when you've spent some time in the bush, John, it kind of gets into your heart. It gets under your skin and it's, it became it became the driving force really in everything I, I did. And so even the work that I was doing with youth, I would take them out into wilderness areas just because I knew it had such a powerful effect on me and I wanted to share that with, with other people. And so mm. that transition and love for the bush was gradual, but eventually it got to a point where it was kind of overwhelming and, and I just felt completely called to move lock stock and barrel to the bush and it was at that point that i i gave up everything i sold my apartment i i kept my car 
and I sold all my material possessions pretty much, except I kept the hi-fi system that I still had because I like to listen to music. And I put that in my car together with one duffel bag and um, and then I moved to the bush. And the, the move itself was was quite interesting and quite um, quite tough in some ways. You know, obviously not just not just moving from a, a very highly urban environment and existence to one where there are no creature comforts and no luxuries but um so i so actually you, had i just want to ask you so did you have yeah. any any initial moments where you were like wow what am i doing here is this the right decision and did you come up against any unexpected obstacles as you as you started this transition? Because it's interesting, Absolutely. right? I mean, because it's interesting, like you went from architecture, you went into management consulting, you figured that was your passion. And obviously it is, it, it, you know, it is a it is a passion and that, but you discovered an even bigger passion. And I just wanted to underline that for people that sometimes they think maybe they've discovered their passion, but maybe it's always good to look a little deeper and open up your eyes because maybe there's an even bigger passion beyond that. Well, and that's that's so true. I think, John. You know, the the what what I've learned over over time is that life is fluid, and life is a process, and it is organic. And what what is right right now might not necessarily be right down the road. Uh, you know, people change. We we our world view changes. We we have things factors that that influence our our lives and our decisions, and and all of that changes. And so. I learned quite quickly, you know, without at the risk of uh, of sounding flaky. It, it's not about being flaky. It's it's about understanding that life is fluid and that that um, things do change. And so, um, and that's a great question in terms of the obstacles. And what what I what one of the one of the major obstacles really was that to land a job working in the bush because, of course, I had that very bad habit called eating. And I needed to find a way to support myself. I couldn't just um, move, you know, in, to, in a very idyllic uh, way. I, I needed to find a way to earn a living. And so the only way to really earn a living um, as, as a, a kind of newly uh, graduated university graduate was to work as a game ranger. But in, in the national parks, the, they required very stringent zoological and biological training of which I had absolutely none. I had completely the wrong background, completely the wrong degrees, uh, but what I did have was a dream and I had a passion and, I, and it was burning for me. So um, I, I learned that one could possibly get a job as a, a game ranger in the private reserves. And so these are reserves that fall within the greater Kruger National Park wilderness area but the land is privately owned. And so the, the owners of the, the land have, have free reign to kind of do things a little bit differently. And um, the, the game rangers that they were hiring there were field guides as well. So we, had, we, we kind of wore two hats. We wore the hat of the game ranger, which is the kind of custodian of the environment. And then we wore the hat of a field guide, which is to, to take guests who were mostly traveling from abroad into South Africa, take them on safari for two, three, four, sometimes five days and help them to both see the animals and understand the environment. And so that was a, a very, very big part of our job. And because that was such a big part of the job, communication skills were probably much more important actually than the, the fundamental knowledge, because if you can't communicate that knowledge to the guests, they, you're not going to make it in that in that environment. And so um, I was lucky enough to have been on stages, been in training with, you know, trained a lot of people. So I was no, I was not afraid at all of speaking to people and being in front of people. And I, in a sense, been guiding people my whole life up till that point, just not on safari. And so I, I I, I, I think, and I, I subsequently learned this because I became the training officer at the lodge that I worked at, at the reserve that I worked at, mm. where it, it, the, one of the criteria that we looked for was the, the, that applicant's ability to communicate properly. And so um, 
but again, you know, one of the big obstacles was I had the incorrect background, the so-called right. incorrect background. And but so, you uh, you but know, you found, but you found, you found the way, and you were able to, you know, to find the opportunity. And I also just wanted to draw a line, underline that uh, thing about communication, because I do think that is so critically important. It doesn't matter what area you go into; it doesn't matter how highly technically skilled it is or whatever. Uh, you still need the ability to communicate and persuade people, and Absolutely. probably more, probably more than ever, probably more than ever now. Um, right now, so yeah. yeah. So when you when you got into this and you 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 were now a bush ranger and you were taking people out on safari and all of that, you, you obviously pretty quickly developed a, a fascination with the big cats, right? Um, so. Uh, Number one, I mean, I, I'm going to say, number one, I'm going to ask you, you know, why the big cats? But I mean, it would probably be pretty obvious to everybody because they're just phenomenally awesome animals. Um, but what did you, um, how did you develop that fascination? What did you learn from them? And then what did you learn that could be from these big cats that could be adapted to your own personal and professional development? Another great question, actually. And, and so the, the process of kind of, Becoming the big cat guy was also a slowish, a slowish one. Um, and I, I, I should probably preface what I'm about to say, John, by by really emphasizing that, you know, that the, an ecosystem has millions of organisms in it, and there, mm -hmm. there's not one organism that's less important than another. And you know, in in South Africa and in safari, in the safari industry, there's a big emphasis on what is known as the big five which are the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. And actually most people, when they talk about, they come to Africa, they want to be on safari and they want to see the big five. They have no idea that actually those five animals are got their name because they uh, from a hunting, a hunting term, it was a hunting term. Um, but those five animals are no more or less important than the tiniest organisms in that ecosystem. And so um, while, I absolutely do love the big cats and I am fascinated by it and I've made my life's journey, made that a very big part of my life's journey. Uh, it's, I don't, I don't favor the big cats. <laughs> I love them, but, and there's so much we can learn from them, but there's lots we can learn from all the organisms. So that's just a little waiver, a little um, disclaimer up front. But um, in answer to how I, how I got to sort of, have a develop a, some expertise and a fascination and an understanding of the big cats is that what happened was as you rightly pointed out the guests who are coming to those reserves who are coming on safari they want to see the big cats they you know those are kind of i call them the sexy animals mm -hmm. they're they're yeah. awesome they're mysterious they they behave because they're higher order mammals they behave a little bit more closely to us humans they they have um, they have features and characteristics that we kind of relate to, um, and certainly in the hunting process and and in in the way that they operate, they they do display some very highly um, highly functioning functioning cognitive abilities, and so you know they've got to figure things out. They 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 are not like the herbivores that just can put their head down and pick up a blade of grass. They have to find their food, and that requires higher cognitive functioning. And so, um, what happened was, I was, um, I was kind of personally fascinated by um, by the big cats when I got there, just because so much of of their behaviours echoed and mirrored what I'd seen in the corporate world in terms of their strategies, their modus operandi. The, the way they found their food, the way they had to deal with change, the way they had to deal with competition. Because, you know, I, I think a lot of people look at lions and they think, oh, they're the king of the jungle. They have such a great life. They actually have a very, very tough life. The mortality of young lions is extremely high. They're in constant competition with hyenas, leopard, cheetah, um, Yes, they do tend to dominate that food chain, but you know that all of all of these factors um, made just for me were were just fascinating and and echoed very strongly, paralleled very strongly what I'd seen in the corporate world in terms of 
the way us humans deal with competition, face change on a daily basis, um, have, have specific strategies, have, has, have specific niches that we occupy. So all of that kind of really rang true when I looked at the big cats. And so I started to do a research project um, to study the area's leopard, lion, and cheetah populations, to try and understand a little bit more about not only what makes these big cats so incredible, but you know what what we can really learn from them in terms of the way that they have succeed, succeeded over millennia. You know, and so I just looked at it and I go, hey, these guys have been succeeding for millions of years. They must be doing something right, and there's got to be something that we can learn from them. So I, I initiated a study. Um, and kind of seconded the help of my fellow game rangers. And, and it became quite easy, actually, you know, um, it became quite easy to glean some information. I'll just explain that very quickly, why that was. Right. So we, we were um, a group of, on, on the reserve I worked on, we were a group of about 10 rangers operating at any one time. And we operated over roughly about a 5,000 hectare area, which is a pretty big area. Mm -hmm. um, and it would take you um, probably the better part of a full day to drive the surface area of all the roads that we had, the network of roads that we had on that 5,000 hectares. But the way that we worked, we operated out of two lodges. And so there was a lodge in the south and there was a lodge in the north. And then we would spread out and we were in radio contact with each other in our vehicles. And so if I found something exciting, I would tell my colleagues and I would tell them the location, which we, um, I won't go into it. We didn't have, we had street names, but it's not, um, we, we used certain landmarks and, and certain um, uh, ecological uh, um, uh, benchmarks to be able to right. say, okay, I'm at this point. Um, and we didn't have GPS in those days and it, it mm -hmm. wasn't. It, so we would have to manually kind of guide our fellow rangers to the spot where we were if we were looking at a lion or a leopard or an elephant or, you know, some of the, the more kind of sought after exciting game. And so through that process, we were spreading out and covering much of that area most of the time. And the big cats in particular are very territorial, John. And so right. they don't, they, they move, they move over that territory, but they stay more or less within a, a certain home, a defined home range. And so we knew that we were seeing the same individual animals or the same individual prides of lions always. And there were, there were um, probably on our area, there were three prides of lions that we saw from time to time. And sometimes on our area, we might see all three in different three different places. Sometimes we might only see one. Sometimes we might not see any of the three prides. Um, and there was also a coalition of a dominant pair of males that moved on that area. And then in terms of the leopard, we would see there were probably about five different females that we knew we were seeing and about three different males who, who kind of operated on our, on our sort of territory. Right. And right. you might ask, okay, well, how did we know the one leopard from another? How did we know one lion from another? Yeah. Lions are a little bit tougher to tell from, from one another, but they too have a very distinct whisker pattern on either side. Right. Above their whiskers, they have a certain dot formation. And lions also often get into fights. Um, they have certain distinctive <laughs> features like nicks in the ear, a scratch on the nose. Um, and so we were able to tell the lions apart from one another and certainly the leopards have very distinctive spot patterns and so we were able to identify leopards from one another and we and over time um, I started to photograph these animals to develop a, a, an identicate kind of library and so we looked at when we looked at we came across a leopard we could know that she had two spots here and three there and we knew that, that was two three and we gave her the name Kuzumanzi female and so you know, over time, we knew we were, we were seeing the same animals. And then it became very easy to understand their movement patterns, their behaviors, their feeding habits, their prey selection. And over time, we built up a lot of great data on, on the animals that we were seeing.